This video is in the home owner and concept. Last time we watched the mediation video on in Tuesday. Software, software problem. Yes, and and class and PM. Yeah. There was a woman who was doing the mediation. Okay. So how is mediation different from negotiation? Song that shit. What's the main difference between negotiation? There's a very obvious difference between negotiation and mediation. Negotiation discuss two parts and mediation discuss What's the name of that? Third party, right? You said there's two parts in a negotiation or two parties. In the mediation there's a third party. Song Dashil, what does the third party do? in a mediation. Um, mediation. Um, mediate each other. Mediate is the verb, yes. What does mediate mean? two parties, help the two parties to make an agreement, okay, mediating. So the next question, what type of mediation is involved in this clip, evaluative, facilitative, facilitative or transformative? Uh, Kim ye -won, not here, over here. Yeah. Facilitative. Why? What is she doing? What does facilitative mean? Yeah. 
mediation? What did we say facilitative mediation was? Here. So what does, we discussed what does mediate mean, what does facilitate mean? If I look at facilitate in the dictionary, what will I see? Help someone. Help. 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 Help somebody to. Do you want to look up these two terms in the dictionary? Mediate and facilitate. <coughs> Definition at dictionary.com. To settle a dispute as an intermediary between two parties. To bring about an agreement as an intermediary. Do you understand intermediary? Yes. What about facilitate? To assist, to make it easier or less difficult, to help to move forward, to assist the progress. Okay? So how did the how did this lady facilitate the the mediation? Facilitating is more than advising, it's more listening, right? And discussing. Okay? Evaluative is more decisive. Okay? So facilitating is more allowing them, listening to them, discussing with them, allowing them to find a conclusion or a settlement. Okay? To make it easier for them to make an agreement. And then the last question. What score would you give out of 10? Suck <coughs> young Kim. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Uh, Why do you usually laugh if I ask a student a question? Uh, because you say to any student is first is family name, but he, she is the last family name. Kim Seok Young. He, she said, you say Kim. Her name is written in English as Sogyeong Kim on the on the thing. Do you want me to call you Sogyeong Kim or Kim Sogyeong? I don't care. Or just Sogyeong? <laughs> I don't care. Maybe I should call you Kim Sogyeong, then he won't laugh. All right. Each time. So Kim Sogyeong. The third question. So first you have to give a score to the mediator. From one to ten, what's the score? Mm. Eight. <laughs> Eight. Why? Um. Ah. Uh, in on the video. Yes. Ah. Ten. Ten. Mm. Why? Oh, uh, she. She. I think. She had. Oh, very good listening skill and um, she <laughs> um, she con consider consider each party's feeling. Mm -hmm. So I think she tends to Okay. So the mediator is di is different than a negotiation, right? There's a third party, and she used they call the caucus, where she met privately and confidentially with each party to find out whether they had any private concerns or private interests. They don't want to say or express. Express means they don't want to say to the other party. So she can try to control the emotions of the parties to make them less emotional. Okay? Facilitative, and then she did well active listening. Same thing. When somebody says something, what is active listening? Hmm? She reacts about their conversation. Yes, so how can we do active listening in English? You don't do active listening in Korean. Use the gesture. Hmm? Use a gesture. Gestures. Gesture. Yes, but that's not key. 
there's more important things for active listening. What gesture would you use if I'm talking to you <laughs> <laughs> to show that you're listening to me? Shake my head. head. Okay, gesture is using your hands, so you mean body language. So moving, nodding your head, body language. So we can nod, right? What else, what else can we do for active listening? Asking. Asking what? Yeah, what kind of reply? I see. I see, what else? <coughs> what else can we say? We're going to use today, you're going to be a mediator. What else can you say as active listening? Well. Well. Well, what? Well, I expect you to. I expect you to say something after you say what? Well. well, I see. <laughs> well, I see. Okay. Anything else? I get the point. Uh, I get the point. Anything else? I I understand. Does I understand mean I agree? No. Anything else? Mm. I know. Anything else? You can say lots. And plus adjectives. We should use an adjective. Adjectives are good for active listening. What kind of adjectives would you use if I tell you some good news? But good is a very simple adjective. You need to use something more descriptive. Great. Great. Excellent. Excellent. If you use these big words like awesome or excellent, you sound more enthusiastic, right? What about if I give you some bad news? This is too bad. bad. <laughs> <laughs> bad um, sorry to hear that. Sorry to hear that. Okay. So, when I came to Korea first, Korean people didn't do any active listening when I was talking to them. They just stood there. <laughs> So then I, I, I was repeating myself. I would say something and they just stood there. So I would say it again. Then I look at them, they don't say anything. Right? I don't know what's happening. It's a communication difference between the cultures. Korean people don't do active listening very much. But if you speak in English, you need to do active listening. If you don't do active listening, people will be confused and they will think you're not interested in them or you're not listening to them. Okay, do you understand? Yeah. So you need to say something after somebody finishes the saying. You can say, ah oh, yes, that's right. Okay? Or, I understand what you're saying. I hear where you're coming from, but if you want to give a different opinion. Okay? Well, you should make some kind of reaction. That's interesting. That's interesting is probably the easiest one, most useful one. Okay? You could say that's interesting for any, anything, almost, right? Doesn't mean you think it's good or bad, you just think it's interesting. Okay? Then you can continue on with something else. You can also ask the follow-on question. Do you know follow-on question? Looking, probing question for more specific. We saw in the... She asked, can you be more specific about blah blah blah, right? You should have written down some probing questions. So she does well some active listening. She also suggests options to consider. So she gives them some options they should consider. <coughs> so for example, she can suggest that, uh, can you finish before the deadline? And then they said, yes, if we have more staff and more money, we can finish before the deadline. Okay? Yes. So she suggests the option. Reality testing. When did she do reality testing in the, in the video? If, uh, if, if you have the money, you will finish the deadline if she has the, the computer problem. Mm, but reality testing was when the guy, the, the uh, guy from the PM, 
who was making the robotics. That guy wasn't very cooperative. He was in bad mood and quite emotional, right? So he didn't seem to want to cooperate. So she had to do some reality testing with him. Reality testing was telling him, if you don't make an agreement today, this is going to be the real situation. You're going to lose your contract. You're going to lose money. It's going to be a lose-lose situation. And you're going to lose too. So, so she was testing the reality with him. So it's important to know about communication skills that we have to be assertive. Do you understand assertive? Without being aggressive. Are you assertive? Do you understand assertive? We have the dictionary open, so we can type in assertive. Okay, confident, positive. Okay, having a this 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 kind of one here, right? Confident, self-assured, positive, decisive, or forward. Okay, so. Some people have a problem, they're not assertive. And actually, being not assertive is worse in business than being too aggressive. Okay? So let me give you the situation. In this case, which is worse? The woman doesn't say anything to the guy about reality testing because she's shy, she's not assertive, she's not confident. Do you understand confident? Right? So she doesn't say to the guy about the reality testing. She just says, oh, okay. Right? Or she says to the guy aggressively, hey, but you're going to lose a lot of money. Which is worse? Not to say anything or say aggressively? Say it worse. No, not saying anything is worse. Okay? So not saying something aggressively and rudely is bad. We shouldn't do that. But the point is that the worst case is not to say anything. It's the same in the company. Okay? Some people are shy or they, they think I'm a very nice person, uh, so I'm not going to say anything. But actually it can be worse for them in the long run and, they need, and the company. So they need to learn to be more assertive, right? Because the woman said that to the guy, she was assertive and she told him the reality testing. The guy, it was a better result for the guy, right? So he was better that she told him that. So if she had told him that aggressively, he might still be better off. Then if she didn't say anything, that's the worst case scenario. Right? She didn't say anything. The guy doesn't think about that option and doesn't make any agreement. That's the worst case. Okay? So we have to understand about communication skills. We have to communicate politely. But in the end, not communicating is worse than communicating impolitely. Does everybody understand that? If we make a scale, one, two, three. Number one, assertive and polite. Number two, aggressive. Number three, not assertive. Okay? So it's the same in mediation. If you, the worst mediator is going to be the person who doesn't do, is afraid, not confident, doesn't say anything. Because of course you're going to have a problem, problematic person. They're angry and emotional. That's why they can't make the negotiation together, okay? because they're angry and emotional. So if you just are not confident and you allow the person to be angry and emotional, then as a mediator you're not doing your job. Okay? So that's what she did well. She was assertive and she was polite and assertive. Is it that difficult to be polite and assertive and not to be aggressive? No, it's not, right? So just we don't be aggressive but communicate to the older person. So especially the young, younger people, they might have a problem with being assertive. So I have to stress that you have to learn. When I started working, that was my problem. I wasn't assertive enough. So I wasn't confident enough and I didn't communicate enough with the people. So if you don't do that kind of thing, right, you're very shy or not confident, then you, it can be worse for everybody. It's worse for you, it's worse for the other person. Okay? So you have to learn to be assertive. But being assertive doesn't mean you have to be aggressive and rude. Okay? There's a right way to communicate things. 
and it's better to communicate in a nice and polite way. So diplomats, do you want to be a diplomat? Diplomat? Ban Ki-moon is a diplomat. Do you, what is a diplomat? What does a diplomat do? A person appointed by a national government to conduct official negotiations with other countries. Do you want to be a diplomat? No. Make negotiations with other countries? Okay. Diplomats are very good at that skill. So if you watch what the diplomat writes or says, the diplomat never gets angry, never gets aggressive, never is rude. Okay? But the diplomat is also never shy or not confident. Okay? The diplomat has to be assertive. If they are not assertive, their country is going to be pushed around. Okay? But the diplomat doesn't want to make a war. Okay? So they are going to be very polite, but polite in a strong way. So learning that kind of skill is called diplomatic skill. So if you can learn to communicate in that way, it's good maybe for your personal life, but also for your business life. Right? So if I give an example of a relationship, for example, some woman, just I want to mix up, some woman is going out every night drinking, getting drunk, right? It's not my wife. <laughs> every night she comes back at 3 o'clock in the morning, right? And uh, smelling of soju, right? Uh, so the guy is very shy and not assertive. So he says, nothing, just, okay, no. <laughs> right? Then, what's going to happen? The guy is going to be very sad, right? And depressed. Yes. And then the woman, is the woman going to be happy if her husband is very depressed and sad? No. No, so which is better? That the guy tells the woman that he, he's not happy, that she's coming home every night at 3 o'clock in the morning, or he says nothing? She's to tell. Tell, right? And which is be better? He tells aggressively and rudely, like, Hey, what are you doing? Call me back drunk. You're a disgrace. I'm sorry I married you. Right? You're an alcoholic. Stop drinking. No. Saying that or saying nothing? Which is better? Saying rudely or saying nothing? Which is better? Saying, saying rudely is still better because you're communicating. Right? Do you understand the point? Yes. But what's better than saying rudely? Politely. Saying politely and assertively, right? So maybe you wait until the weekend, some quiet time, you ask to go for a walk together, and then you say politely, you can ask them, what do you think of effect your drinking is having on our relationship, right? Then they have to think for themselves, and they might say, I think it's okay, right? And then you might explain that, well, the reason, right? I feel bad because I don't know where you were and I'm worried maybe something can happen to you, right? Then they understand and then they can change their behavior. Okay? So also in the relationship, you need to have that kind of diplomatic communication skill. Okay? But whatever, your personal relationship is your own business. If you want, you can say nothing or you can be aggressive. But the point is that you need to learn a different personality when you are doing business, okay? So some people are very shy, but they work in sales. So they have to change their personality at work. They have to be very outgoing. When they go home again, they're shy, they don't talk, okay? But at work, they have to be outgoing. So the point is, I'm not trying to change your personalities, but when you do work, or you're dealing with the negotiation or mediation in your work, if you're not an assertive person, you need to learn to be assertive, okay? If you're a rude, aggressive person, you need to learn to be polite, okay? So, <clears throat> we can practice doing that today. So first we're going to study about a case study, about uh, just a short case study about mediation, and then we'll practice. So we're going to look at George Mitchell in Northern Ireland, so, I'm from Ireland, so I know well about this situation, right? So, George Mitchell was a US senator. Do you understand senator? 
sanitary politician in the U.S. So uh, he is mediator between these two parties. Okay. In Ireland, we have in Northern Ireland, we have nationalists. Nationalist wants to be part of Ireland. Okay. Unionist. Union wants to be part of the British Union, the U United Kingdom. Why? Right? Uh, they are Catholic. Irish people are Catholic. Why? Because Ireland is traditionally Catholic. England was Catholic too, until they had a crazy king. Did you ever hear of <laughs> King Henry VI? He had, I think he had some psychological problem. It's my personal opinion. <laughs> he killed six of his wives. Why? Right? And he also decided to make his own church. Nowadays, the English people still follow that church. Am I biased? Do I sound biased? <laughs> yes. I'm from Ireland, so I'm Catholic, right? So the Queen is the head of the church in England. Ever since that time, the King in England made his own church. It's called the Anglican Church. The Queen is head of the church. What do you think? Is the Queen qualified to be head of a religious organization? Okay, I can't say that, but you can say that. <laughs> I might get into trouble. But I'll just ask you the question, right? Maybe she doesn't have the best qualifications to lead a religious organization, right? But she's more nominal. These days, nominal head. She appoints the archbishop, and the archbishop is the real head, right? Who has the suitable qualification. Of course, in Catholic, the head of the church is the pope. They are called Republican, they want to be in the Republic of Ireland. They are called Loyalists because they are loyal with Britain. Okay? So, on this side, we have IRA, Irish Republican Army. This is a terrorist group. It doesn't exist anymore because of this mediation. Right? They kill people, shooting and bombing. Because in Northern Ireland, there is a British Army. So they did some bombings in London. Do you understand bomb? Yes on the subway in London, yeah. or they guerrilla warfare, right? They just kill the British Army soldiers anywhere. If the British Army soldier is at work walking, they just shoot them. They think the British Army is a legitimate target because they think they're at war with Britain, and they think it's okay to kill the soldiers, right? But of course it's not okay. They're a terrorist group. You understand terrorist? Yes. That's their opinion. And they have a political party. Usually, a terrorist group has a political party called Sinn Féin. Okay? This is another political party with no terrorist group. On the other side, we have UBF and UDP. These are terrorist groups on the other side. They kill, uh, they carry out attacks on members of the Sinn Féin or Catholic people in Northern Ireland. Right? They are also a terrorist group. And they have their political party. Okay? So they are killing each other. Are the emotions going to be high? Are people going to be angry? You killed my brother. Right? You killed my son. Is it going to be difficult to make a mediation between these two sides? Or easy? Difficult. Difficult. Difficult, right? So, this US guy, Clearly, between Ireland and the UK, the US would be a good mediator, right? This US guy is working for Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, do you know Bill Clinton? Yes. So Bill Clinton is also involved, and actually Bill Clinton got most of the credit for this agreement or mediation. So Bill Clinton was like mediator here as well. So we discussed about Bill Clinton before. We said when Bill Clinton goes to a country, he listens very... The first questions he asks is what are the main issues for the other side? Okay? So he's very good at listening and finding out about the interest of the other side. So George Mitchell is working for him. So his aim is to make an agreement between British and Irish governments and these political parties in Northern Ireland. So it took 22 months. This mediation took 22 months. Okay? It had a six-day negotiating marathon to try and end the violence. You understand violence? in Northern Ireland. So here are the sides, Nationalist and Unionist, Catholic and Protestant, Republican and Loyalist. Catholics 40% of the population. Loyalists 60% of the population. Okay? So Ireland is here, 
and England is UK is here. The UK used to own Ireland. Okay? And then Ireland got independence after the First World War in 1920. Most countries got independence after the World Wars. Right? Ireland in 1920. Because the UK made an agreement. The same with India. If a lot of Irish people fight for us in the World War, maybe we'll give you independence after the World War. Right? So a lot of Irish people fought with the UK in World War I. At the end of the war, the Irish carried out some terrorism campaign against Britain, and Britain gave some independence to Ireland. But Britain kept this part. Why? Because only here British people lived in Ireland. They came to Ireland and they lived just in this corner. So they made it on purpose, so that they had 60%, 40%, right? 60% English, 40% Irish. Okay? So they made this country, Northern Ireland, part of the United Kingdom. Okay? So this is the problem. So uh, they want to join Ireland, and they want to stay in the UK, and they're having terrorist problems. This problem has been going on for a long time. Is that an easy problem to solve? No. The Pope came to Ireland. Do you know the Pope, the head of the Catholic Church? Yes. He came to Ireland in 1980. His solution was, have more children. <laughs> told the Catholics, uh, have more children. Uh, then after 10 years or 15 years, you're going to be more than Protestants. Uh, and it kind of worked. Nowadays, it's nearly 50, it's 50%, 50%, right? Uh, Something like that. So, <clears throat> the starting point, the two governments created this commission called the International Body on Decommissioning of Weapons. Do you understand decommissioning? I, don't, I guess not. Decommissioning means that uh, you give up your weapons. The terrorists take their guns, they bring them and to the government. The government destroys the guns and the bombs, right? That is decommissioning. So that is how you get rid of a terrorist group, peacefully. The terrorist group voluntarily brings their guns and their bombs and gives them to the government. The government destroys the guns and the bombs. So the governments appointed this guy Mitchell. They thought he would be fair, impartial, and he was acceptable to all parties. So when we have a mediator, they should be acceptable to all parties. Okay? <laughs> if we got some Irish politician from the US, they're not going to accept him, right? So this guy is neutral. So what did they do first? Him and his two uh, co-workers met with dozens of party leaders and governments for six weeks. So they met privately with the party leaders and the governments, okay? They worked for long hours, like the lady, we saw it took seven hours for her to do the mediation. Listening, taking notes, she was taking notes, right? When you're doing your mediation, you will be taking notes. Did you know that people like when you take notes, when they're talking? They feel important. <laughs> right? Uh, devising the outline for the report. They gathered information on issues like languages, flags, you understand flags, anthems, national anthem. Prisoners' rights, discrimination. There was discrimination against Catholics in Northern Ireland. For example, you apply for the job, you're Catholic and you're Protestant, I'm going to hire you because you're Protestant. Right? Kind of discrimination. Okay, and police force. The police, most of the government jobs was Protestant because if you wanted to join the police, you had to sign a document saying the Queen is the head of the church. But the Catholics didn't want to sign that document. So kind of like discrimination too. So the police force was all English or English people. Okay? So actually it's not so much a religious. We say Catholic and Protestant, but not really a religious problem. It's a national problem. English came from England originally, or Ireland came from Ireland originally. Okay? So uh, they had some different positions. So these are the positions of the parties. The British government and the Unionist parties, they said that the paramilitary organization, the terrorists, also called paramilitary, they have to give up their arms, weapons, before the negotiation. So if you want, we don't negotiate with terrorists, right? 
So the British government said, if you want to negotiate with us, first give us your arms, and then we can negotiate. Right? Did the terrorists want to do that? No. No, if they gave up their arms, they lose some kind of bargaining power, right? So they, they said, no. After the negotiations are finished, then we'll give up our arms. So this was the key sticking point. The Irish government, they agreed with the British government, the terrorists should give up their arms, but they said that's not practical. We'll never have a negotiation. If they have to give up their arms, we'll never have a negotiation. So George Mitchell is the mediator here. So this is one of the questions he has to, the mediator will have to decide. Do they give up their arms before the negotiation or after the negotiation? Right? So they have to find a creative solution. After listening to the two sides, understanding their position, the mediator's job is to find creative solutions. Okay? What would, what would be a creative solution here? What do you think? British government says no negotiation with terrorists. Right? Terrorists say after the negotiation we can we can stop the terrorism. Can you think of any creative solution if you're the mediator? Maybe we could have a ceasefire. Do you understand ceasefire? Ceasefire means that the, the terrorist group is not going to do any violence. They keep their arms, but no violence. They agree to ceasefire, right? Something like that. That's kind of a creative solution. Okay? So, this is a quote from Mitchell. He says, We were convinced that decommissioning prior, before the negotiations, was unworkable. Um, not possible that the terrorists would give up their arms. What we recommend is that we would provide the unionists with enough reassurance to enable them to enter into negotiations. So they're going to reassure British government and the unionists there, there will be no violence during the negotiations. So this is a creative solution. Okay? They're not going to give up their arms, so let's provide some assurance. So they gave Another idea, parallel decommissioning, a strategy that worked in El Salvador. So it means while we're negotiating, we're doing commissioning, decommissioning little by little. So after one month of negotiating, they give up some of their arms. After two months of negotiation, they give up more of their arms. Okay? So we can see this is a key point of the mediator, key skill, finding the creative solution. Are you a creative person? Can you find creative solutions? Can you find creative solutions? No. No? <laughs> hmm? Do you understand this idea? Yes. Parallel at the same time? Yes. It worked in El Salvador. They had a problem. The British government didn't, didn't agree with that, right? The British government said, no negotiation with terrorists. Okay? But eventually, Mitchell was able to convince the British government to accept and the British government accepted. Okay? So the mediator also persuading, like the woman persuaded the guy from PMC. Do you understand persuading? Yes. To accept. The, another creative solution. He said, the problem in Northern Ireland is mistrust. You killed my brother, I killed your mother. <laughs> Do we trust each other? No. No. Right? So he said, the community thinks the worst about the other. If there is going to be a durable peace and real reconciliation, what we need is the decommissioning of minds. So people have to change their mindset. That means trust and confidence must be built over time in all parts of society. So another creative solution, okay? not just looking at the point of decommissioning and negotiating, also thinking in a big picture. We need to help the communities to trust each other more. Okay? Do you trust North Korean people? No. Never? Why not? If you see a North Korean person do, in their military uniform, do you think the worst of them? Or do you think them in a positive way? Negative. Negative way? Think the worst. So both sides are thinking the worst of each other, right? 
So he said they have to learn to live together if we want to make the society better. So <coughs> currently we're talking about the process. So he had to decide the process for the negotiations. So this was the first the first negotiation was the starting negotiations, right? Do we give up the weapons or not? So they found a solution. Now we're starting the negotiations. Now he has to mediate about the different points. Okay? So they had first they had a big, it was called plenary session, with 48 people in the room. Three people from each party, three people from each government. Okay? And he was the mediator. Do you think that's useful? 48 people in one room with the microphones? No, right? He, sa he said after one week, this is the wrong process. Okay? We talked about finding the right process. Okay? So he decided to change. He said, we're going to have bilateral meetings, just meeting privately, or two parties together. Okay? Just in the so small groups. So work it in small groups. So he changed the process, and then they agreed on the agenda. So the process was like this. Uh, talk about the different points, internal relations inside the country, Ireland and Northern Ireland ties, the UK and Irish relations, and business. And then each point, just he talks with some parties. Right? So just the Irish and UK relations, UK and Irish governments. So by, this was one of the key things for making success, because the UK and the Irish government, they want to find a solution, right? So if he's able to separate them from the political parties in Northern Ireland, political parties in Northern Ireland really hate each other, right? Don't want to talk to each other, okay? So he can separate these governments out, away from them, then he can find a better way to make uh, an agreement. Okay? They can agree on things, then he can talk separately with the other other parties. So then he started to make success with this process. Okay? He started to make some compromise. So all the parties agreed. We have to find what do all the parties agree on? This is a good base, right? Everybody agrees on something together. So they all agreed that they need to identify the key issues for resolution, for solving. So only when all of the issues were seen together, the parties could understand where we can make the compromise. Okay? This was the phrase. So that's a simple thing, but at least everybody is agreeing. We want to get everybody agreeing. So that's a good idea at the start of the mediation. Find some common ground that everybody agrees on. We'll be practicing later. Okay? So everybody agrees we need to talk about, just find the key issue and talk about the key issue. So the key issues was police, the police in Northern Ireland, prisoners, the terrorist group wanted their prisoners to be released. They said they're prisoners of war, not real prisoners, right? A civic forum, so that people can be involved in decision making. How, to, how we're going to make decisions, safeguards, and of course, giving up the weapons. So these are the issues. So <coughs> they, they made that kind of uh, issues and then they were... This is the successful part of the compromise. Uh, signs of chemistry became evident. Do you understand chemistry? Like, they're getting together. We hate each other, but we're starting to get some chemistry. As the parties and personalities got back to each other's points or ideas in other than negative tones, right? So you said, with your parents, you tried to make a more positive tone. This is what he was using here, right? People was giving their ideas in a very negative way to the other side. So he, he as the mediator, got them to talk, not using the negative vocabulary. Okay? Using the positive vocabulary and in a positive way. So parties canvassed their various proposals. Canvass means made or supported. But most importantly, they explored each other's ideas, seeking further explanation and offering explanation for their own ideas. So maybe I don't understand your idea, right? 
So if my wife comes home drunk at 3 o'clock in the morning, maybe she doesn't understand. Why don't, what's the problem? I'm not her, I'm just having fun and I'm young, there's no problem, right? But then if I explain uh, very, like, oh, I'm worried, I'm, I don't know where you are, it's very late, anything could happen if you take the taxi by yourself, that kind of thing, right? So in this case it was the same, okay? Once again, that's not the real story. <laughs> I have to stress. <laughs> My wife doesn't drink, right? So, just in case. So, uh, by doing this, they could listen to each other's reason, the reason for the, their ideas, and they were able to make a compromise. And then they made an agreement. So the last part, they made an agreement, okay? So nowadays, the, no more terrorists in Northern Ireland. Okay? So very historical agreement. Uh, Bill Clinton said one of the most successful things of his presidency to make the peace in Northern Ireland. Okay? No more terrorism. And also the Irish, Irish Prime Minister, Bertie Ahern, and Tony Blair, the British Prime Minister, also said the same kind of thing. They're very happy about their presidency, that they made a peace situation in Northern Ireland. So the, two the governments and the parties reached an agreement. So they made a new institution, a, uh, Northern Irish, a government for Northern Ireland, with more independence from the UK. Okay? Still part of the UK, but more independence. So they decide their spending on education and healthcare and so on. Okay? Uh, a North-South Council, so a council for improving the relationships between Ireland and Northern Ireland. Okay? Uh, this council will deal with these sensitive issues like prisoners and decommissioning. So this agreement proves that democracy works and we can say to the men of violence, your way is not the right way. Violence will not solve the problem. Okay? So this is an example of a successful uh, mediation. When you're doing your final presentation, you'll be doing something like that, right? Case study of some famous negotiation or mediation. You can also use a mediation, okay? So do you have any question about this case study? And let's take a break for 10 minutes. <coughs>